Thank you very much for having me. Clearly, uh, very uh, familiar with technology, and I don't even know how to put this uh, microphone properly. So please forgive me if I have any problems with this presentation. So uh, I'll be speaking a little on the intraoperative uh, means by which we use, um, particularly transesophageal echo echocardiographic assessment of the right heart, and in a slight uh, counterpoint to on the uh, the fantastic images that you see from cardiac MRI and also from transthoracic that uh, Julie's taken you through. Um, unfortunately, uh, us uh, in the operating room don't have access to as much uh, highly detailed and, uh, in fact, time-consuming assessments of the right ventricle. So, from um, some perspective, we do have to make do with um, slightly specific information. Um, but uh, as I'll go through, that does tend to uh, reflect the fact that we use this information in a slightly different um, means. So, uh, a lot of this, Julia, has already gone through, so I won't um, go over through it again. The, uh, the contrast between the right and left ventricles um, uh, from a uh, anatomical perspective does make um, all, all echocardiographic um, measures much harder to, to uh, be reproducible and reliable. And uh, for all these um, uh, reasons already that uh, Julie's touched on. Um, from a physiological perspective, we know that the right ventricle tolerates acute changes in its preload and afterload much more poorly. And this has particular um, impact on us as uh, critical care physicians in the operating room in that we have direct influence on RV afterload and preload through uh, changes in ventilation and oxygenation which will have a, a very dynamic effect on pulmonary vascular resistance. And um, the whole nature of uh, the volume changes within the operating room also have uh, a direct impact on the right ventricle. Anytime we give systemic uh, venous volume that will uh, automatically increase the right ventricular preload very quickly and any time that there's surgical hemorrhage um, that will uh, reduce it very quickly as well. Um, and particularly from a cardiac surgical perspective, which is uh, my area of interest as a cardiac anaesthetist at the Austin, um, all of the uh, impacts that surgical interventions and as well as um, supports um, being given by and then and slowly taken away by our perfusion team and bypass machine mean that the right ventricle really does copper beating uh, over a very short period of time. Um, so from that perspective, to uh, give a bit of um, an extra insight into what I'll be leading into, the, um, the echo markers that we use, um, one, um, from a transesophageal perspective, do uh, come from a slightly different um, point of view than transthoracic, and also um, means that we use the information to provide very uh, rapid responses and interventions, rather than something that is based on uh, prognosis. Some other um, further physiological principles which are important, because the right ventricle exists not um, uh, uh, in isolation, but um, in uh, very close uh, interaction with the left ventricle. Um, the left heart really can only give what the right heart gives it. And in absence of any shunts, um, we know that the right heart cardiac output is essentially the left heart preload. So there's a very big interdependence there. Um, we know that the uh, left ventricular septum is pretty much the splint against uh, which the right ventricle contracts. And at least some part of the contraction is going to be a passive effect as the left ventricle contracts and brings the free wall of the uh, RV in towards it. And uh, again, with direct relevance to critical care physicians and us um, managing patients' ventilation in the operating room, as soon as there's any degree of hypoxemia or change in uh, arterial CO2, we know that um, a normal dynamic pulmonary circulation will automatically increase its afterload and strain the right heart again. And this is a very uh, eloquent demonstration of that effect um, uh, through some uh, research in uh, ph physiologically normal right ventricles where um, if the pulmonary artery pressure increases as a result of pulmonary vascular resistance, the stroke volume of the right side declines very rapidly compared to that of the left. So uh, a little bit more about what I've been alluding to here. Um, very often in the operating room during a cardiac operation, the uh, cardiac anaesthetist is also the echocardiographer and is busy doing multiple things apart from providing uh, insights into the right heart function. We'll be managing the patient's airway and ventilation as well as making sure that uh, um, vasoactive drugs are titrated appropriately and managing hemorrhage and volume state. And it's for that reason that um, the reasons, uh, or should I say, the measures that we use in ECHO for assessing the right heart um, must be uh, very quick to, um, to be acquired. They must be reliable um, and we must be able to reproduce them in the same patient between interventions to see what the effect of eight interventions are. So Julie's already gone through the basics of, uh, of the topography of the right ventricle. Um, it's obvious uh, that really for such a complex um, three-dimensional structure, no single two-dimensional scanning plane is ever going to capture everything simultaneously to provide a good overall view of right ventricular function. 
And uh, this uh, sort of cage representation by a 3D echo um, demonstrates that quite nicely. During systole, the tricuspid annulus descends, the apex uh, is drawn up, and the infundibular, um, infundibulum contracts, as well as the free wall coming closer to the septum. I don't know why it is that we didn't get that uh, picture there, but that's okay. Um, this is uh, a uh, summary of the same markers that Julie spoke about that are the validated indices of right ventricular systolic function. Um, I'm not going to touch on diastolic function today. As, um, routinely in the operating theory, we have access to direct central venous pressure and hence right atrial pressure monitoring and hence uh, application of diastolic um, uh, parameters for the right ventricle um, doesn't add that whole, uh, a, whole, a whole lot to our um, decisions about whether to intervene or not. Um, definitely uh, an area which needs some more investigation though, as we separate out what um, correlations between right atrial pressure are, whether it's due to the volume state or whether it's due to actual RV compliance. And I think once we get more information about what RV diastology means for uh, RV compliance rather than volume state, it'll be uh, very enlightening for us. Some of these uh, numbers are, will probably be slightly out of date compared to uh, Julie's most recent um, uh, um, information. And the limitations that uh, Julie's already uh, spoken, spoken about already. Um, and particularly, uh, I'll be talking about TAPSI and S prime um, being a, a very isolated and easy to acquire, and hence very attractive for us to use in the operating room measure. Um, there are some limitations to its use in the perioperative context. So uh, we've already discussed about how uh, fractional area change is calculated. And uh, in particular, I should also mention that uh, the trabeculated nature of the um, RV we know tends to confound uh, manual tracings to try and get these uh, measures done accurately and, and reproduced reliably within the same patient. But uh, it tends to foil automatic, automated border detection as well. So uh, if uh, any of you are using automated border detection for these calculations, um, uh, very much like it, um, every other aspect of ultrasound, it's important to do some manual tracing as well to reassure yourself the machine's not telling you lies. Um, the very attractive uh, aspect of using TAPSI and S prime in assessing the right ventricle intraoperatively is the fact that it uh, can be gained quickly from a single view. Um, I've got a trans thoracic uh, sort of um, approach here to calculating this, but in the operating room we only have transfers off the geal echocardiography where the probe is sitting behind the left atrium rather than at the apex. And that will um, bring in some complications to how we interpret our results of these um, measures as well. But uh, by uh, getting a single um, M-mode cursor through the uh, lateral annulus and also getting some uh, tissue Doppler through there, um, we can um, easily put together some of the uh, measurements required to get these assessments, um, including TAE index as well. Um, I, I won't go into any more about the TAE index currently because uh, being a measure which um, requires multiple um, uh, measures to get a, a result about what's abnormal and normal, we don't tend to use it very often in the operating room. So uh, the uh, particular parameters that um, have been validated have all been done on transthoracic um, uh, echocardiograms in normal subjects. So trying to apply that um, via transesophageal echocardiography in the operating room does pose some questions about how valid these measures, measures are between different modalities. And in fact, if you look at uh, the scanning planes here between TOE and, and transthoracic, it's clear that it's not quite 100% the same, even though um, most of us would assume that a four-chamber view is a four-chamber view. And I hope um, my very simple echocardiograms will play um, in contrast to the very nice ones that MRI um, showed us previously. This is a transthoracic of uh, a four-chamber view in uh, one patient. And uh, in the next patient, in, in the same patient here, um, after the patient's been induced uh, under general anesthesia and had a, a transesophageal echo probe inserted, that's the same four-chamber view again. And um, it's even obvious, uh, looking at the same heart with the same loading conditions, that the right ventricle just doesn't look quite the same, nor the motion quite the same. So, hence, there is going to be some confounders here between using the same measure between transthoracic and TOE. So uh, it's interesting that um, Haddad and colleagues in their um, seminal paper in 09 um, in anesthesia and analgesia uh, imply that these measures can be um, obtained equally via TOE, um, via the deep transgastric RV inflow outflow view, which is a surrogate for trying to obtain the true lateral annulus for things like uh, S prime uh, pulse wave Doppler through the lateral annulus or, or TAPSI, although it was never really specifically um, implied in the text. And similarly, for um, calculating fractional area change in TAPSI, um, this was implied uh, in, uh, in these diagrams as being a four-chamber view by TOE being the same. And in fact, that measuring a single two-dimensional um, 
uh, measurement from the lateral annulus to the apex between uh, diastole and systole will be equivalent to our properly aligned in mode cursor through the, um, the tricuspid annulus. And these are old figures here as well. So what we decided to do was to test these hypotheses and look to see if there was in fact any systematic bias or underestimation between um, these uh, validated measures that have been used in transthoracic and what we are trying to use them for in the operating theatre by TOE. Um, so we looked at uh, end diastolic area uh, being um, a very convenient method by um, us as uh, in the operating room looking at uh, a surrogate of end diastolic volume of the right ventricle. Um, there's because really what we're looking at uh, intraoperatively is how our volume interventions change the right, ventric right ventricular ejection fraction or systolic function as we load them higher and higher. The, um, the, the uh, point behind this being that really as uh, intraoperative um, uh, physicians we're trying to maximise the patient's uh, right side of cardiac output by getting at them at the peak of their frank styling curve of the right heart. And also looking at these different proposed methods of measuring TAPSI which um, have not uh, been validated by TOE by the different views, the deep transgastric RV inflow out for the and also doing these single measure measurements from the um, lateral annulus to the apex. And uh, using bland, the bland Altman comparison and some uh, linear regression to look at uh, how the, the measurements um, uh, track. And uh, I hate to disappoint, and, and unfortunately the correlation was very poor. Um, the, uh, the, the bias was very, uh, was very small there between the different methods, which implies that there isn't really any systematic underestimation or overestimation between the two methods, but rather that there is an inconsistent uh, means by which TOE uh, has a different scanning plane relative to transthoracic in each, in each patient. And a very wide uh, standard deviation of the 95% limits of agreement between um, the two modalities. Um, the percentage error here is a, uh, a proportionality of um, the limits of agreement compared to what the average measurement in, is in the sample population. Is essentially saying that if your, the limits of agreement are wide, then how wide are they relative to the average measurement you're taking in your sample? And this is represented here graphically. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the analysis, uh, the y-axis on a bland Altman comparison refers to the difference between the measures um, by each modality, and the x-axis is the average between those two measures. Um, a very broad scatter here for fractional area change where the average um, uh, upper, upper limit of normal is 35%, plus or minus 20% doesn't really cut it. Um, end diastolic area was slightly better but still not uh, very good where the uh, measured end diastolic uh, area being the upper limit of normal about uh, 15 to 20 centimetres squared, a plus or minus 10 to 15 doesn't really uh, um, bode well for um, validation between a method. So. Um, apologies for the, some of the formatting areas coming out here. Um, for those uh, who aren't familiar with all the, also the terms that we use when comparing those, um, met those uh, methodologies, the bias here is um, how much um, one method might underestimate another and in this particular e example the bias is low. Uh, the 95% limits of agreement is the two standard deviations of the spread of data around this and uh, the precision being one standard deviation. And the percentage area as I mentioned is, um, is a proportion of that error uh, relative to what the average uh, measurement is. Julie's already touched on the small how small changes in rotation um, can affect um, our reproducibility of fractional area change and really we shouldn't be that surprised that there was such a diversion um, in the measurements uh, between transthoracic and TLE um, because the same, uh, the same limitations apply to getting an optimised four chamber view in transesophageal. Um, we have a probe that's sitting in the, in the esophagus and a set of a zero degree sector scan rotation with TOE and you'd think that that would provide a much more stable means of getting reproducible measures. However, um, during cardiac surgery, as soon as the mediastinum is open and the pericardium is incised, automatically the heart is rotated and although a probe doesn't move, the patient does move and hence the, um, the precise sector scan rotation will change even though we've done nothing to the way we're positioned to the probe. So for the same reason there is going to be confounders there as well. Um, however, when we looked at the uh, linear regression and, um, and correlation, we did get st st statistical significance with some moderate correlation between the two measures. Um, uh, clustering here reasonably tight for end diastolic area um, and not quite as good for fractional area change. I might go back just for a second. So um, what does all this mean if our precise measurements uh, per uh, patient um, happen to have such broad limits of agreement but yet the, um, the correlation between the two with increasing values tends to be uh, uh, better correlated. Um, 
And I, I, I would uh, argue that uh, for the purposes that we're using these, in these images for, um, a, a track of an increase and in a measured parameter in response to an intervention is really all we need when, we, when it comes down to transesophageal assessment. Because uh, as critical care physicians, we're looking at how giving a volume load to the right ventricle or changing a ventilation parameter could help uh, with increasing cardiac output or reducing the, um, the right ventricular preload. So as long as we're seeing a track in the correct direction with the way that we intervene for these patients, perhaps that's all we need for our, um, our measurements in transesophageal echo. Um, it's a very busy slide, um, uh, unfortunately, but really a summary of the other uh, data that we've got here from using different views for TAPSI and also different methods m for measuring TAPSI. Um, all of these came out even worse than fractional area change in end diastolic area with percentage area, uh, errors much higher than uh, previously uh, referred to. And um, really all I, wanted to add, all I want to add here is that um, the American Society of Echocardiography recommendations uh, to not apply angle correction when doing um, vector dependent measurements such as TAPSI and uh, S prime should be adhered to. As when we try to angle correct for the um, abnormal incident angles that TOE offers compared to transthoracic for doing things like TAPSI and S prime, uh, in fact the uh, percentage error got uh, another 50% worse. So the take home message behind that is that there really isn't a good substitute for obtaining a good incident angle from when you're trying to achieve these measures. And uh, some disappointing scattergrams of these other um, TAPSIs, uh, methods of achieving TAPSI and S prime. <coughs> so uh, some further bad news about TAPSI, unfortunately, in intraoperative setting is that um, in cardiac surgery, for whatever reason, TAPSI tends to be reduced even though global ejection fraction is increased. Um, and it tends to be un unrelated to the bypass time and cross clamp times, which we see uh, most definitely influencing um, our uh, recovery from the insults of cardioplegia. And uh, no one really knows what this discordance is about, but there are some proposed um, um, methods. I'm going to divert very briefly now to put this in the context of greater, uh, the greater picture of critical care. And that one of our colleagues from the Austin published an anesthesiology to look, to look at some of the more commonly method, used methods of left ventricular uh, uh, cardiac output um, to, to show that even though we use these very regularly in the operating theatre to measure systemic uh, perfusion, the percentage errors are already too high to, to be considered within the, the, the limit of 30% error. And that uh, followed that up by um, using a hybridization method of combining some of these non-invasive measures to try and improve accuracy when, when in fact uh, combining two uh, semi-invasive measures brought the estimation closer to the gold standard of bolus thermodilution. Um, and our graphical representation of how this is achieved. And uh, this echoes, no pun intended, how um, uh, Radsky et al has, has mentioned in his, um, in his uh, editorial that really there is no really one good measure of right ventricular systolic function that we can um, rely upon to get a global view of what the right ventricle is doing. Rather, we should be incorporating several different measures as well as that overlaying the context of what we're trying to interpret. And uh, a very um, a big overview of, of what we do as uh, anaesthetists in, in theatre. We're not looking at the cardiac output of the right ventricle alone. We're putting in the context of how it's being influenced by pulmonary vascular resistance. What that measured pulmonary artery pressure that we're, uh, we're measuring with our pulmonary artery catheters means is it a left heart backward pressure or diastolic dysfunction or acute uh, micro regurgitation from uh, post bypass uh, change in compliance. And, uh, and we use this, this sort of global map to decide how it is we're going to intervene, not just based on uh, should we be maximising the right ventricle or not. Um, and uh, all of our different interventions here based on achieving not just change in one parameter, but really a, a global goal, um, in particular um, getting the patient off the table and uh, making sure that the surgical procedure has parameters that's, um, that's matched so that there's no bleeding suture lines and that um, uh, the systemic perfusion of the right heart is maintained. Thank you.